then you go big again with uh, phase three and it really kicks off with this film. And I was watching it last night and I'm like, you've got two sides of America fighting together, almost not hearing each other out in 2016. It seemed like a perfectly timed uh, film in many ways. Well, that goes back to the uh, Civil War coming at a time in 2016 before an election. For us, it was, hey, there's this great storyline from the comics that pit Iron Man and, and Captain America against each other. You could only do that storyline when you'd had enough movies behind you for that to mean anything, to know enough about Tony Stark's point of view, to know enough about Steve Rogers' point of view, to believe they could face off with each other that way and have it be heartbreaking and emotional. Not knowing, of course, that, that when the film was released, the world would be in much, divided in much the same way in the country. Uh, I, I think it's another one of those, you know, even below the surface, you know, we're influenced by real life. As we as we make these as we make these movies, and I think that was one of the reasons Civil War touched such a nerve, is because we were looking at these two people we love in a way that you know two halves of the countries that clearly love each other as a country as a whole, but facing off and how do we how do we deal with these differences in a superhero movie? They punch. The take with new directors in this particular phase seems to take it to an even new level. Obviously, mm -hmm. with, with Taika continuing with the Russos, but then you know you had a horror film director come in and do. Doctor Strange. Right. Doctor Strange was something we hadn't really ever seen before. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first time you saw those special effects? I would do interviews like this going back almost 10 years and people would say, well, what down the line, what do you want to, what, what characters do you want to see come to screen? Would always mention Black Panther, would always mention Doctor Strange. Because both of those characters tap into entirely new worlds within the, within the Marvel Universe. And Doctor Strange, the master of the mystic arts, Sorcerer Supreme, the whole notion of sorcerers, the whole notion of, of the multiverse and these parallel dimensions is really important in the comic storylines. And we wanted to be able to have access to that in our stories. And Doctor Strange was always the notion of, of being the end point to that. He also has one of the best origin stories. The notion of the mirror dimension, the, mo the notion of literal mind-bending imagery, which Scott Derrickson from the very first meetings would talk about, you know, wanting to embrace sort of the psychedelic nature of the of the time period in which Doctor Strange was created in the comics. And it was in the visual effects reviews in post-production after we'd shot most of the movie that we really realized that this would, the mind bending was going to work. That this twisting of cities, being in a mere dimension that we'd never seen before, going into the multiverse on what Scott would call the magical mystery tour that the Ancient One sends Doctor Strange through and culminating in a face-off against a bad guy that you can't defeat, you can't fight, punches aren't gonna work this time. And it really, that even goes back to the quantum realm in Ant-Man and wanting to take audiences, give audiences a little taste of these super weird mind-bending imagery that we could start seeding into the MCU. And then Scott blew it out with uh, Doctor Strange. On the subject of Strange, I'm, I'm wondering what Taika's uh, what his pitch was to you when he said, I, I'm, I want to do Thor oh. this way. How did he explain his vision? Taika, amazingly unique filmmaker. We knew we wanted to do a third Thor film that, again, as we had done with Cap's third film and Iron Man's third film, go in a completely different direction, a totally unique case. And we had, we had started to beat out the notion of Sakaar and Hulk, Gladiator Hulk being involved and Hela being the villain and had internally at Marvel Studios started to work on what that story could be and we started meeting with filmmakers. Taika came in, he made amazing films in the past, one of which called Boy, we just loved and said, well, here's the, here's the guy because it's funny as hell but also is moving and touching and again, we never want the spectacle or the comedy or you know the outrageousness of different planets and aliens uh, to take away from a, a core emotion. And, and Taika had done that. He also was working on another film at the time. He was finishing another film that we hadn't seen and didn't see until we were deep into prep, which was Hunt for the Wilder People, which was another amazing film that he happened to make. We'd go, oh, what are you working on? He'd go, oh, just a little film. And we went, oh, okay, I guess it's a, some small film. We're working on Ragnarok, and we go to see it, and we go, this is a, amazing. This is incredible. People think we're smart because we hired the filmmaker of... of of uh, Wilder People, but we hadn't seen it when we when we cast him. It was really Boy that uh, convinced us. And it was the meetings with Taika. He always wanted to do a movie like this. He always knew he had a, a bigger scale movie in him. And I think he trusted that we wanted to do different things with the characters. He and Hemsworth had known each other in passing before that and really excited about the notion of working together. And he worked on a sizzle reel that he, that he brought to that first meeting 
that was hilarious and was perfect, just clips from other movies, clips from the other Thor movies, cut together with his own, with his own unique take and tone, and he used the immigrant song in that. Asgard is dead. And it just unlocked a whole new thing for us. We went, this is, this is it. This has got to be in the movie. This song's got to be in the marketing. And of course it was. Spider-Man was a, a special project for you because it was kind of full circle. You had been executive producer <clears throat> on the, the Tobey Maguire. What was it like to take that journey with that character and, and, and re-envision right. it? I feel like in every phase and in every project and, and as cheesy as it sounds, every day at Marvel Studios, there's something amazing and special that happens and makes me appreciate being a part of it. It was particularly special getting to introduce the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of Spider-Man into Civil War. Because I was lucky enough to be involved on the Sam Raimi uh, uh, Spider-Man films and was low man on the totem pole and just got to w watch Sam work and, and learned a lot from them. And when it came time, uh, Sony was talking about additional Spider-Man films and doing more. It, it, was, it was really gracious of Amy Pascal to hear me out when I suggested incorporating him into the, into the MCU. And then doing an MCU Spider-Man film with Tony Stark as his mentor and, and tapping into a Spider-Man that nobody had seen before outside of the comic book. Spider-Man was not created in a vacuum in a world without superheroes. Spider-Man was never the only superhero in his, in his universe. He was part of the Marvel Universe. And in his early comics, he was nervous that could he, he wanted to join the Fantastic Four in those early comics. He grew up in a world where Iron Man would fly overhead and where Hulk would smash cars in the streets. We'd never seen that version of Peter Parker on screen before. And it was an unbelievable privilege to include him in the, in the MCU. And one of those sort of pinch yourself, I can't believe this is actually happening uh, moment. What was it like seeing both extraordinary critical and an audience response to Black Panther, but then to see those numbers and, and those kids coming out of Black Panther challenges and yeah. the way that it became more yeah. than a film. Ryan Coogler had done two amazing movies when he, when he agreed to do Black Panther. We had high expectations. We believed in the character, introducing him in Civil War, seeing the audience response to Chadwick as that character. We knew Wakanda, which we had been seeding in Easter eggs since Iron Man 2, should be an amazing place. And we knew the notion of a movie of this scale featuring primarily African and African-American actors had never been seen before. What Ryan Coogler ended up doing and the way the audience responded and the, and the acclaim and uh, box office numbers behind it exceeded even our wildest expectations. And it's a tribute to Ryan Coogler, who's a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker and a humble, humble man and who tapped into very real questions that he had and answered them in a cinematic way that I think ranks as one of the best, a best way a filmmaker's ever expressed himself or his questions or his views on life in a, in a feature. It was astounding to watch and astounding to see him put it together. And the response to it, I would say we've been surprised at Marvel Studios two or three times, um, none more so than, than the amazing response um, and the continued response to, uh, to Black Panther. What's your favorite post credit sequence? It's too hard for me to say what my favorite one is because it's something that I've, it is so personal to me. I love those tags. As a kid, I would always watch the end credits on a movie, hoping that there'd be something. I think it was you know Ferris Bueller coming out of the shower, and I went, "Whoa, there's still there could be more." And usually there wasn't. So I said, "When we do our movies, let's let's do it." It also allowed us to tell stories in a unique way. So I have great fondness for the first one with Sam Jackson agreeing to come in on a Saturday and shoot this quick scene, again with the promise that maybe it could grow into, into future things, and a promise to the fans that we were gonna try to build the Marvel Universe on screen. I also love shawarma in Avengers because I love seeing all those characters finally united around a table, silently chewing. And I also love that that idea didn't come about until the end, final days on post. And we didn't shoot that scene until after the premiere of Avengers, which taught us if there's a good idea, you find any way possible or impossible to get it in the movie.